Hi, and welcome back to Unplanned. Uh, today we are going to dig into a subject that we've had on the books for a very long time with a return guest, Brent Ryan, a Vice Provost here at MIT in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, and your official title is? Professor of Urban Design and Public Policy at MIT. And we are thrilled because, as you will remember, uh, the last time Brent was on, we talked about Christopher Alexander. And it was, A, a wonderful conversation, and Thank B, you. a lot of people found it so, and we're very interested yeah, by very it. very enjoyable. So that was great. Well, today we are going to talk about... Jane Jacobs. Jane Jacobs, who, in my... Uh, I would, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play myself down, say my fairly limited understanding at some level has been just profoundly influential over the, over the profession of planning and our, our sense of cities um, over the last half century and, and maybe more. Um, we're going to dig into it. Brent knows a lot about it. I think you've even taught classes on it. Um, so. She's a part of my teaching. Excellent. Yeah. So we're going to dig right in. Uh, as I mentioned to Brent before, I'm not working off of notes, so we're going to have a conversation Wonderful. About, about Jane Jacobs. Um, first of all, what is your assessment of Jane Jacobs? I gave my 20-second assessment. What's your assessment of who she is and what she's all about and what she means to this profession that we both care so much about? I would say that Jane Jacobs could be labeled the most important thinker on cities of the 20th century. And what leads you to that uh, strikes me very bold statement? It is. And what, what is it about her that makes you feel that way about her and who she is and what her impact has been? Jane Jacobs was able to center in her work a lot of concerns and issues that over the course of the 20th century and in particular around the late middle of the 20th century became central to how so many disciplines, planners, architects, economists, politicians, even civil engineers, thought about how to act within the contemporary city. These changes were nearly a direct result of her written work and her advocacy as, as an urban actor, because she was also an activist for much of the middle part of the 20th century. And the book that she is most famous for, and the only book of hers that I have read, though I can claim to have read the whole thing and state that accurately, is The Death and Life of Great American mm -hmm. Cities. And that will form the basis of this conversation. I know she's, she wrote a bunch of other books, and you, you, I, you know them. I think you could say she... I think she wrote about seven or eight books in total. Right, yeah. right. But this Some book, circulated only in Canada. Oh, interesting. Where she moved at the end of the 1960s. Interesting. Well, uh, my knowledge of her background is limited to what I've read in the introduction, mm -hmm. which I will just read the first sentence. Jane Jacobs was born in May 1916 in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, that sets her at the beginning of the century, basically, as mm -hmm. the First World War is taking off. Mm -hmm. But she, what she writes about in this book, for the most part, at least my read of it, is her time in New York City when she was living in New York and kind of, although she talks about many other cities, including mm -hmm. Baltimore and San Francisco and Boston, and she sort of mentions all those places, New York seems to form a real, really a crux of kind of where she gets her data from, if nothing else. She is indelibly associated with New York and with the changes happening in urban planning in New York in the 1950s and 1960s, and in particular against the kind of urban policy and urban design that was happening under the direction of Robert Moses, who was a powerful figure in New York at that time. So in this way, and, and this thought actually occurred to me, was on the one hand, you have Robert Moses, who is this sort of towering um, imperial figure. He, is, he dictates, he, he points at a map, and he says, a road shall go. And then you have Jane Jacobs, who is sort of the neighborhood czar, guru. What, what's the right word? Where she's She had many labels, many of them pejorative, because right. she was a woman. Right. She was working from home. People right. accused her of being a, quote, stay-at-home housewife. Right. 
but she utilized that position of working from home where, by the way, probably three-fourths of us would love to say we get to work from home today, so we're all following after Jane Jacobs. But she utilized that position as someone working from home to generate observations on the city that directly counteracted the way Moses, and not only Moses, but the whole intellectual and policy apparatus of urban planning was moving in that time. Well, let's, let's start with that last bit. Mm -hmm. where the apparatus and the sort of urban planning world and sphere was going. Sure. Um, give us, take us into that world, if you can, the world that Jane Jacobs walked into when she started observing New York City around her. Sure. What was that world? So Jane Jacobs is indelibly associated with modernism, even though she spoke against many of the things that modernism and modernists wanted to do. She was born during World War I, World War I was a demonstration of technology in an incredibly negative way. And the whole beginning of the 20th century showed the pluses and minuses of technological advances. Architects got really excited about that. By the 1920s, there were major architectural movements that were fetishizing, utilizing the new technologies of the time, elevators, structural steel, large expanses of plate glass, structural concrete. They were utilizing that technology to generate a new form of architecture. It's a form that we're still utilizing today. We still utilize those technologies today. They arrived at that time, but they went further. Those architects, including Le Corbusier, who was Swiss, but was living in France, who mostly wrote in French and mostly built in Europe, but whose works influenced the whole world, they were thinking also about how the design and the form of cities could also change. So by the 1930s, there were, even by the late 1920s, there were radical urban proposals to rebuild, to destroy existing neighborhoods and cities, and to rebuild them with tall towers, with wide roads, with expanses of parkland. That instinct meshed with another technological and social tragedy, World War II, and a concern for urban vitality in the United States and for post-war rebuilding to generate a whole government-led movement to rebuild cities quite extensively. When they did that in the 1950s, they utilized the tools and the styles and approaches of modernism. So by the time Jane Jacobs was writing in New York. She was a journalist. She was writing for Fortune magazine and other venues. By the time she was starting to write in New York in the 1950s, New York was well along the path with Moses, Moses standing behind it of clearing neighborhoods, building tall towers, promoting highway development, but also creating parks and playgrounds and neighborhood space, a kind of drastic modernization of an older urban fabric and the result was many existing neighborhoods, such as Greenwich Village, where Jane Jacobs lived on Hudson Street in the West Village, were proposed for clearance and demolition. And Jacobs saw that and said, no. Well, one of the things, and this is a thought more than a researched thought, is coming out of the Second World War, I think your comments about the First World War and modernism and the technological advances mm -hmm. and how architects in particular sort of uh, absorb that and then utilize that. But coming out of the, out of the Second World War, mm -hmm. both the, that fact or those factors and then this sense of the huge amount of government uh, organizational power that mm -hmm. took to fight the war right. could then be turned on cities. <laughs> Not, and I say that in a negative Even way. Even against that, cities. Yeah, and, or against cities, but this notion of... Uh, and Jane Jacobs said, don't forget, this is not the rebuilding of cities, this is the sacking of cities. So she's utilizing warlike language to describe what we were doing to help cities. And that it's was radical. And you think about, I mean, just on, on this thought of the, the, just this huge amount of resources that people in power were used to sort of marshalling yes. because they had just built millions of airplanes and millions of tanks and sent millions of people overseas. The atomic bomb. The atomic bomb. Yes. And, and now there was this notion of, well, maybe we could do good That's by right. addressing, and, and she uses the word uh, slums, which was the sort of the 
the the the word it was du jour. A label. It was a label, label for a certain kind of place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and absolutely fascinating. So that's the Moses yeah. side of it. That's An, the a, a technological optimism, a right. sense that this new technology could solve all problems. Don't forget, in the 1950s, they built an ocean liner that was nuclear powered. Right. People thought we had solved every problem. Atoms for peace. Right. Everything could be solved through nuclear technology, through this amazing state power that we've developed, through this harmony of state power and technology. And Jane Jacobs said, wait a second. Right. So what does she do? So you say she's a journalist. She's interested in this stuff mm -hmm. and she's writing about it. What more can you tell us about how she gets active in the world of uh, both the public conversation, but also then activism around these issues. Absolutely. So Jane Jacobs was at home on Hudson Street in the 1950s. And as she looked out the window, what did she see? She saw a mix of older buildings, some from the 20th century, some as old as the 19th, with a lot of shops and types of activities on the ground floor and a busy sidewalk, people walking up and down the sidewalk, cars driving in the street, buses going up and down the street. She saw what we would call a mixed use, mixed building type neighborhood. She looked at that and she said, when you look at contemporary rebuilding approaches, they eliminate almost every single thing that I'm seeing here. And that, in, that included economic relationships, and that spurred her later work, much of which focus on the power of small-scale economic development. But first, she said, there's a built environment here, and there's a built environment that is inhabited by and is meeting the needs of local people. And when you look at how people interact with their built environment, it's valuable. There are a lot of things happening here. And she called this, she gave many names for it. She called it the ballet of the city sidewalk, the eyes on the street. She had a real turn for phrases. And these were indelible terms that she used in her articles that got an editor excited about her doing an entire book based on this concept, which became the death and life of great American cities. And one of the, as you're talking- Cities are for people, I think was the name of her article. Oh, interesting. And one of the points that she makes in this book is that buildings need, of the many, many points that she makes in this book, and, and we'll, we'll get to uh, how current a lot of this thinking is. And some of the downsides of the thinking as well. But she mentions the diversity of the ages of buildings. And yeah. I, that was one of her many observations mm -hmm. that really struck me as a very interesting observation mm -hmm. that today I think we would assume is just to take, take on faith. But mm -hmm. at the time, it presumably was a more radical. It was completely radical. Because if you look at Corbusier's images right. or Daniel Burnham's, there are no old buildings at all. They've all been swept away. Jane Jacobs said cities need old buildings. You cannot have a functioning city economy and a functioning city social life without old buildings. Why? Who lives in old buildings? People who are paying lower rents because the buildings are dilapidated. What businesses are in older buildings? Well, Jane Jacobs was looking at things like barber shops or used bookstores. I think a used bookstore is a great example. A record store. Where are the record stores in Boston these days? They're not in the new buildings. They're in the old ones. She saw old buildings as being a kind of ecology that supported a socioeconomic system that was not only of immense value, it was critical to the healthy functioning of the city. This was her observation. All from what she saw, no measurements. She wasn't using the Ford Foundation's computers. The computers were also beginning at the time. She was using her eyes, as she described it, her eyes and her heart. And it is fascinating because even here, we're sitting in a room here at MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to go very far to see a lot of new construction. And of course, that observation is absolutely up to date as to where we are today in a city like Cambridge, Massachusetts. So quite fascinating there. Central Square versus Kendall Square. Yeah, and it's and that is a yeah, and that's a conversation that is ongoing. And of yeah. course, if you want to start a business and you're just what we used to call a mom and pop business, mm 
Kendall Square is probably not where you're going to start that business. You're probably going to doubt it. Find a find a building that may be a little bit, uh, you know, down at the heel, but right. offers you a rent that you can actually afford and gives you the street life that you need to run that business. That's that. right. And if you think of the urban ideology that comes out of just looking at a single street and saying, hey, wait a second, what's happening here is valuable. That allows you to look at Robert Moses and to look at what was happening at that time and to say, stop. You are sacking cities. You are destroying them. You are reducing the number of businesses by 90%. You are destroying the livelihoods and social networks of people who have lived for decades on these cities, in these city blocks. You're destroying it. And planners are guilty of supporting, abetting, and promoting that ideology. Planners are guilty. This was another observation of Jane Jacob. We've talked about Robert Moses, sure. but you talked about Le Corbusier. Sure. You talked about Daniel Burnham. Mm -hmm. Give us a little bit more of that context because it's that's very, very interesting. She spends a lot of time talking about public housing. Yes. And public housing in New York is, I'm my uninformed uh, impression is that's Le Corbusier sort of on steroids in a city like New York where it's that tower in the park sort of scenario. And she spends a lot of time talking about um, the city beautiful. Right. The radiant city. That's right. And the garden city, right. which were all popular urban design ideals of right. the early 20th century. And right. she says, they're all the same thing. It's the radiant garden city, beautiful. Right. And then she dismisses it. Right. What a powerful rhetorical right. tool that was. And what's interesting in, in those other ones that you're talking about, um, those were efforts, in effect, to get out of the city, to move out of the city. Some the garden. of them were. The garden city was Ebenezer Howard right. in the late 19th century right. saying, the industrial city is overcrowded. It is beyond repair. It is beyond recompense. We are going to move out and create new cities outside where everyone can live in a cottage and walk to a factory nearby. And if you do need to go back to that old city that's called London, take the train back. That was the Garden City. That became very popular in the United States and in what we would call Commonwealth countries, Canada, Australia, as a way of building suburbs. Right. Mostly the middle class wanted to get out and live in larger housing and commute back into the city. So that was the initiation of the suburban movement. Daniel Burnham was part of a different movement. He was a part of a movement of powerful business leaders. As capitalism matured, you had increasingly powerful business leaders in the late 19th century, what we call the Gilded Age, railroad owners, department store owners, um, traders, people who owned commerce wanting to help the city develop. And they looked around their city. Where were, they do where were they going? They were traveling to Vienna and Paris. They came back to places like Chicago or Cleveland and they said, ugly, our cities are ugly. We can rebuild our cities and make them more beautiful. Architects can help. That was the city beautiful movement of the late 19th century, early 20th century. And then Corbusier emerged out of modernism. Right. He was also born in the late 19th century. By the early 20s, he was connected to radicalism and art, the avant-garde, and was proposing housing. He had his rules of modern architecture that he then expanded into his rules for a modern city, and he was generating urban proposals by the 1920s or 1930s. Jacobs takes all of these in turn in her book and demolishes them in order to say, we have not yet found the right way to build our cities. And it was a question I would say that she also herself did not fully answer. Right. But when you talk about, and when we think about post-war suburbanization, mm -hmm. uh, which is very interesting, and she spent some time on the financial component of that, how that became more possible through reform of the finance system that allowed mm -hmm. people to invest in the development of open space rather than the redevelopment of, of city centers. You also get this notion of uh, the stratification or the segregation on, on economic basis yes. of who's left in the city. And, and to me, one of her observations or mm -hmm. one of her implied observations is, or stated observations is, you know, these communities that we call slums are, can be very vibrant communities. Mm -hmm. And in fact, mm -hmm. 
it's really the modernist approach that destroys them. It's really when they are That's right. Organic. Somehow the rebuilding of slums creates the slum or destroys the slum, and you start to wonder whether the rhetoric actually completely makes sense when you delve into it a little more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's spend time. So there she is riding away. Um, mm -hmm. what, what impact does she have at the time? So she's writing these books, and... This book is now an American classic, but what, comes out in 1961. And what what is what impact does it have as it's once it's written? Once it it's is out. both applauded and dismissed. So, in some quarters, it's seen as a critique, which it absolutely was. She was not embarrassed to say it. Um, by I don't know if Moses responded to it directly. He probably wouldn't deign to, but it was seen as a critique of the city building projects and the urban ideals of the time. So it was not necessarily well received on all quarters. There were sexist critiques of Jacobs. Don't forget, a woman, how dare a woman who's at home say something against what all these powerful professional men who've worked in this field for their whole lives were promoting. At the same time, there was a recognition, especially among a growing number of community activists and what you would call the new left a movement of people who didn't necessarily agree with the military industrial complex. Remember, this is the beginning of the 60s. And what's happening as we move through the 60s is increasing skepticism, dismissal, critique, and anger at government in general from the left. We have that anger at government today from the right. But in the 60s, a lot of that anger came from the left. And Jacobs joined that movement wholeheartedly. She became part of this new left that was critiquing government. The Vietnam War, Jane Jacobs didn't critique the space race, but she critiqued the military industrial complex. She saw it as all tied up in the same thing. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very interesting to think about because from me reading this book recently, I think about the world that she was writing into, which is the world of the 40s, late 40s into the 50s, the suburbanization, all the things we've talked about. But of course, from the publication of the book, mm -hmm. over the next decade was, of course, the creation of the New Left, the Vietnam War, all the issues that are sort of... Term and it leads And she us joins these activist movements. Yeah. She joins movements against the construction of highways, against the demolition of neighborhoods. I think she even protested the demolition of Penn Station, which was the beginning of historic preservation. These were citizen-led movements that today are encoded in city policy. But at the time, it was a bunch of people marching around with signs, kind of like Occupy Wall Street. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And she has a whole section on Washington Square Park in Lower Manhattan, That's near right. where she lived. And the fact, uh, as she describes it, that all these planners gave all these different versions of continuing Fifth Avenue directly through the park. Uh, that was a Moses idea. There mm -hmm. was opposition in the neighborhood. And it was left to two women to propose that they just do a temporary no road through the park, see how it goes, see what the traffic impacts were. That's right. And what they found was that the traffic wasn't as horrendous. Actually, most of that traffic was through traffic, and That's it was going, right. it found some other way to go around. This is uh, an era that we're still experimenting with today, when New York closed Broadway in 2015, or when Cambridge has been narrowing Mass Ave. We find, not always, but we find that the traffic often reduces. People change their transit decisions. They move elsewhere. So Jane Jacobs was also impacting the world of traffic engineering. And this was a hard technocracy in the 50s. Planning programs like MIT were training technocrats who used numbers, calculations, algorithms, and the tools of maps in order to dictate solutions that were backed by numbers. So they were empirically correct according to the planners. But what Jane Jacobs said was, what if we don't want it? What if you say the numbers require a highway and we don't want it? You haven't included that. You haven't included these social and political desires in your calculations. Jane Jacobs reminded us that planning decisions are socially constructed, not just empirically constructed through numbers. And let's use that and let's use her and this book as 
maybe the cornerstone or the fulcrum or that point of inflection mm -hmm. that gets us into the 1970s, well, through the whole highway movement and mm -hmm. all the related issues around that, into the 1970s and then into the 1980s, which is really the precursor of where we are today in urban planning. So help us understand how her, I'll call it wisdom, because uh, I think she was, the fact that she was just doing this through observational sort of sightseeing, if we can be so. And some, pretty soon organizational tactics. Yeah, but really transformed, uh, not only the profession, but also how we think about That's how right. cities should be developed or redeveloped or not redeveloped, et cetera. In a very similar way to how Rachel Carson's Silent Spring changed the way we thought about the environment. Right, and just remind us, what year did Silent Spring come out? That was around- I think in 60, 61, and Rachel Carson was dead by 1964. So think of those two seminal works written by two women. Yep. Um, and they said, stop. Right. And rethink what you're doing. Look again. And imagine the impact. But let's stick with urban planning. What mm -hmm. take us through that next generation of planning and that sort of the generation of pro let's call it the 70s, the sure. generation of protest and into sure. the 80s. And what, what, what impact did, did this book have? So the late 60s were a time of extremely rapid social change. And we look back now on that era in music and in culture and in art, the Velvet Underground, all of these radical changes. So quickly, things were happening so quickly, people didn't even understand what was happening. And one thing that was happening was we as a society, and I'm saying the United States into a larger uh, extent the Anglo-American sphere were abandoning the idea of government making large-scale decisions about urban space and the shaping of urban space. By the early 1970s, a couple of things had happened. One, Jane Jacobs had left the United States. In the late 60s, she moved to Canada. She said, the Vietnam War, I can't handle this anymore. She said, I'm not a good citizen of an empire. Mm -hmm. She moved to Canada, to Toronto, which at the time was a small provincial city before Montreal's economic growth decanted to Toronto, and she stayed there for the rest of her life, so for the next 35 or so years. She, she became a Canadian citizen, mm -hmm. and her children became Canadians. By the 1970s, also, the entire urban renewal apparatus was stopped. It was stopped by Nixon, mm -hmm. a Republican, who was in power after 1968. And by 1972, 73, Nixon was using rhetoric that would seem very familiar to the right wing today. He said, it is not our job in Washington to make decisions about the way you live. We need to get rid of these pencil pushers and hand power back to the citizens. Mm -hmm. Now, in a slightly different way, that rhetoric is quite alive among the right wing today. Mm -hmm. So actually at that time though, it was the right and the left joining hands and both of them said, we want the government to go away. The government is too powerful, it's making mistakes, it's destroying my neighborhood. That's a bit of an irony that I think planners today are uncomfortable acknowledging. But if you think about it, Jane Jacobs was a libertarian. She did not like big government. She thought people should make decisions for themselves. Well, who does that sound like? Does that sound like today's left or today's right? So by the 1980s, that had become ideology. The government in the United States and in the UK with Thatcher and Reagan completely got out of the business of financing large-scale urban development. They created small-scale block grants. Essentially what they did was they cut the budget by 90% and said the remaining 10% cities can spend it as they wish. And that's the model we follow today with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, handing out small grants to cities to use as they wish. We decentralized that urban spending. The pencil pushers were gone. And it's interesting, that whole change in attitude about the government. I mean, the, the, a person we haven't mentioned in all of this, but comes up in my brain is, is John F. Kennedy, and of course his, the wise men and the brain trust. And that the early- The great society. The great society in the early 60s, both optimism and determination that with, get a bunch of smart people in a room and they'll figure this yeah. out. And, and she seems to, to be the antithesis of that, is that those people won't figure it out. In fact, they'll probably get it wrong. Yeah. And that actually the knowledge exists at the ground level, yeah. on this street corner, yeah. in this block, or in this neighborhood. Um, really fascinating. There's a, there's a great song yeah. written by Donald Fagan about the 50s. It's called IGY. Mm. It's International Geophysical Year 1957. And he says, 
Machines will make big decisions programmed by people with compassion and vision. And that encapsulates the way people in the 50s and 60s thought about things. Let machines and the big government and wise technocrats make the decisions for society, kind of the way China does today. Mm -hmm. Different part of the world, but that model's not obsolete. It's just left the United States. So where do you think we are as a profession, as urban planners, given this history? I mean, I yeah. am not actively out there doing any planning, but I have had the thought in the course of my working life of, well, sometimes we're a little bit too hamstrung. Planners yeah. are too yeah. worried about- We're too hands off. About what the neighborhood yeah. is gonna feel we, about the this. The dialogues are too long. Right. Yeah, the community we're, voice is too powerful. Right, yeah. and so where, what's, your, what's your take on all that, on that question? I, I started to rethink Jacobs. I acknowledged the wisdom and the power of the argument. I started to rethink Jacobs when I started looking at places like Cleveland and Detroit. And I saw that as of the 1970s, the government had stopped. They had stopped clearing neighborhoods. But that didn't mean, as Jacobs hoped and argued, that the urban economy of the citizens from the ground up would rebuild the city. And if you just left the government, let the government go away, that revitalization would happen. That happened in Boston. Look at Boston rebounded. And people started to think that that was associative. If the government goes away, the city will rebound. That didn't happen in Detroit. And I thought, something's missing. The government left, and in its wake was nothing. The government abandoned the people of the city. Jacobs was wrong, or she wasn't entirely right. Just leaving power to citizens didn't work when those citizens were poor, when they were being oppressed by the police, when their population was dropping, when there was intense violence in the neighborhoods, as in all of these post-industrial cities. You couldn't organize a neighborhood under those circumstances, and you certainly couldn't rebuild a city. Jane Jacobs stayed away from issues of race and structural racism. She, I, I don't know if she was uncomfortable with race or if she just left it out. She didn't really engage in that element of urban thinking, which became very openly acknowledged in the late 60s. And it's kind of come and gone, and it's again widely acknowledged today. She didn't acknowledge that. So I saw that as an issue in Jacobs' thinking. Now today, there's another problem with Jacob's thinking. There's another a, a British writer called Owen Hatherley. He's a leftist. He loves modernism. He went to New York and he said, Jane Jacobs set New York on a terrible path. Why? If you look at where affordable housing is in New York today, guess where it is? It's in the stuff that Robert Moses built. The only affordable housing left in Manhattan is in those big, ugly towers that Robert Moses built that destroyed urban neighborhoods. The remaining ones have all gentrified and they are pricey and they are being developed out of control by a neoliberal, capitalist-focused city government. And real affordability and urban life is found in those towers. And Owen Hatherley even walks through the towers and he says, even the businesses all the local, they provided more businesses in these complexes than people give credit for. So Hatherley said, Jacobs had no answer to gentrification. She knew how to stop urban development, but when we stop urban development, what do we get? We get a housing affordability problem, we get rampant gentrification, and we turn over the development of the city to developers. That's the bind that New York is in today, and they don't know what to do. And that problem has extended to nationwide. Yeah, it's a no, bind. I, I do, in reading this book, I, I, I had that sense of the, I mean, you can't see the future. It's very hard to see the it future. And I, I think the world in which she was living, all people with means were departing the cities. And so That's what was right. left was something that should be pitied and maybe paternalistically taken care of. And she said, no, that's not the right way to do it. What she couldn't foresee or what she didn't foresee, although she does talk about financing to some degree, mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's interesting there, is she Gradual doesn't- Gradual versus catastrophic financing. Exactly. Yeah. But she doesn't see where we are today, which is this huge wealth disparity between the people at the top end and the people who are really, really struggling at the bottom end. And cities seem to be the, uh, the stage on which that play is performed every day. And 
none of that is foreseen, at least to my eye, none of that's foreseen. It's in not, but you can see seeds of it because the anti-government rhetoric is really strong here. Jane Jacobs, as I said before, was a libertarian. She didn't really know how to admit governmental thinking into her work. She saw what the government was doing as mostly bad. Citizens agreed. If you stop the government, what do you then do when gentrification gets out of control? Governments today have lost their capacity to think progressively about city development, and they've handed over initiative to developers. That's gotten us in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Well, leave us on a slightly upbeat note. We, I think we both will agree this is a profound book in many ways, and it, it certainly uh, shaped the profession, and more than that, it shaped the way people, I, I would say everyday Absolutely. people. Absolutely. It's incredibly valuable. The last chapter of the book, The Kind of a Problem a City Is, yes. is worth reading yes. and rereading. Yes. And I, I have to say, uh, I reread Jane Jacobs about every two or three years. Not only this one, but The Economy of Cities, her next book, which is also quite fascinating, just to be reminded of the freshness of thought, the diversity of arguments, the power of the thinking. She's a wonderful writer. We could all write as well as Jane Jacobs. We would be very fortunate. And when she talks about the kind of a problem a city is, she was right, because despite problems of affordability, despite problems of uh, too much historic preservation, perhaps, as some people have said, cities are problems of organized complexity. And right. we are continuing to think about how to understand that organized complexity and how much should we direct that complexity versus just let it unfold as it goes. So should we be laissez-faire? or dirigiste. The French have, as usual, the best words for these concepts. Jane Jacobs tended to go a little bit toward laissez-faire. We now see the dangers of laissez-faire, but that doesn't mean that switching back to being dirigiste, top-down, is necessarily the answer. Her observations are not wrong. The ballet of the city streets is true. The eyes on the street are true. The value of old buildings, small blocks, mixed uses, they're all true. She's allowing us to d generate better models of urban development and telling urban designers and urban planners to grow just to complexify their models and to raise their level of thought. Cities are not simple lines to be drawn on a map. They're complex organisms. We learned that in part from Jane Jacobs, and we should continue to keep that in mind as we think about cities today. Brent Ryan, thank you for coming back on Unplanned. Thank you for helping us understand and get into Jane Jacobs, a truly interesting person in, in urban planning. And we look forward to having you on the show again. Thank you, Sam. I enjoyed the conversation.